I'm just going to head something off at the pass right here. The person we're covering in today's video has a Mongolian name. It's an old Mongolian name. We're not really even sure how it would be pronounced, and I'm certainly not Mongolian. So I'm just going to go with Kutayun. I looked up some videos on YouTube. That seems to be a sort of accepted Western pronunciation. It's what I'm going with. If you really want to, you can have a go at me in the comments. So the Mongolian Empire is remembered for their barbaric conquests and the power of their great leaders that managed to spread the empire across several continents. But one of the most fascinating people who has been forgotten from the empire is the warrior princess Kutuyun. She was the great-great-granddaughter of Genghis Khan, and she truly inherited his strength in battle. Unlike many other princesses and queens throughout the history of the world, Kutuyun was remembered for her own glory rather than the achievements of a husband or a son. She may just have been the strongest Mongolian warrior of all time. And in this week's biographics, her life. Before we get into the details about the life of Kutuyun, it's important to go over some of the details of the Mongolian Empire. For thousands of years, various tribes in Mongolia went to war with one another, and they were never united under one single government. Lands and horses were taken as spoils of war, women and children were seen as the property of men, and they were used as trophies of conquest. Powerful men had more than one wife, and chieftains typically had a harem. Genghis Khan became the first leader to unite all of Mongolia. He achieved this by training his army to be masterful warriors that were stronger than any other army in the world. They trained falcons to send messages and communicate with one another, which helped him to spread his army over vast territories. He pushed his men to train harder to become a new breed of super warrior. Genghis Khan once said, A man's greatest pleasure is to defeat his enemies, to drive them before him, to take from them that which they possessed, to see those whom they cherished in tears, to ride their horses, and to hold their wives and daughters in his arms. Genghis Khan's army was so strong they were able to defeat the tribes one by one. After uniting Mongolia, he set his sights much farther than his own country. He wanted to become the ruler of the entire world. He took over parts of Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. It became the largest empire in the history of humanity. Even though their army was known for being ruthless warriors, the Mongolian Empire actually brought a lot of innovation to the world during times of peace. They were tolerant of religions, they encouraged international trade, and they were known for their diplomacy. Genghis Khan had several wives of his own, and he had many, many children. His grandson, Kublai Khan, became the ruler of Mongolia in the year 1260, and his brothers and cousins held positions of power all over the empire. Unfortunately for Kublai Khan, he was not as feared as his great-grandfather had once been, and Mongolia would eventually begin to break off into civil wars. Kublai Khan would even go to war with his own brother, Arik Bok. A man named Kaidu was Kublai Khan's cousin, and he was the leader of the House of Ogadai. The two cousins disagreed with one another on how to run the empire, and this would eventually cause them to go to war as well. Kaidu had 14 sons, but his favorite child by far was his daughter Kutiyun. An Italian explorer called Marco Polo wrote down the history of the Mongolian Empire whilst living amongst Kublai Khan's royal court. Most of what is known about Kutiyun's life came from his books, as well as some comments made by a Persian statesman named Rashid al-Din. She was called by several names, including Aigyam, which translates to Shining Moon. While this is a beautiful name to give to a baby girl, she would grow up to prove that she was far from a dainty princess. Because of Genghis Khan's legacy, future generations of Mongolian warriors were trained to be some of the strongest people on the planet. If they wanted the Mongolian Empire to stretch across the globe, they needed to be prepared to take down any enemy. By the age of two, boys were already learning how to shoot bows and arrows and ride on horseback. They wrestled one another to learn hand-to-hand -hand combat. They practiced both the Chinese martial arts of Kung Fu as well as ancient Mongolian fighting techniques. They weren't just doing all of this training on foot, either. All of their fighting techniques also needed to be executed while riding at high speeds on horseback. This included both wrestling and archery. Because of this, their enemies would almost never be able to knock a Mongolian off of his horse, no matter how hard they tried. 
In Mongolia, horses are a huge part of their culture. The number of horses actually outnumbers the human population. People ate horse meat and they drank mare's milk. This milk was actually fermented into an alcoholic beverage, which is considered to be the national drink of Mongolia to this very day. There is a saying, a Mongol without a horse is like a bird without the wings. While all of this training, fighting, and partying was normal for boys, it was almost never taught to girls. Women were expected to be delicate and subservient to men while they took care of the farming, the child rearing, and various household tasks. Cutie Yoon was a tomboy since she was young, and she wanted to practice fighting with the boys far more than she was willing to dance or play with dolls. In his record of his adventures, Marco Polo describes Cutie Yoon as looking statuesque. She was so tall, one might mistake her for a giantess. Since the members of the royal family always chose the most beautiful women in the country to take as their wives, she would have also been very pretty, most likely looking like a modern-day supermodel. But unlike most princesses, Kudo Yoon isn't remembered for her looks. She was known for her incredible wrestling skills. You could say that she was the world's first celebrity female wrestler long before the ages of GLOW and the WWE. She was so ahead of her time, it would take hundreds of years after her death before female wrestling would even be an acceptable sport around the world. Mongolian star wrestling is very different from what you see on TV or even what you saw in your high school. There was no separation of weight class. Just two people lock arms and they try to push each other over in any way they can. Imagine arm wrestling, only using your entire body to push the other person down to the ground. Once the opponent is knocked to the floor, the person who remains standing is the winner. Because of this, the person's physical strength usually determines who the victor will be. Kuriyun practiced wrestling and continued to get stronger every day. She was soon better than any man she had ever gone up against, and she had the goal of becoming the strongest wrestler in the world. When she was old enough to get married, several suitors began to show interest in making her their wife. Her father, King Kaidu, began to prepare some eligible suitors for her. Kuriyun was not afraid to speak her mind to her father and rebelliously announced that she could never marry a man unless he was able to defeat her in a wrestling match. At that time, even princes were not usually able to choose who their wife would be. Politics it trumped falling in love, and marriages were usually meant to keep peaceful ties across the empire. But since she showed so much strength, Kaidu gave his daughter his word that she would be free to marry any man of her choosing. An official proclamation was written and spread across the empire, announcing that his daughter was looking for a husband as long as he defeated her in wrestling. The entry fee was a hundred horses. If they lost, they'd have to forfeit their horses to the House of Ogedai, which would only increase the wealth and power of their army. Despite the fact that horses are such a huge part of Mongolian culture, people usually only had one or two per households, if they were lucky. Owning a hundred horses was no simple task. A man would have had to come from some kind of nobility to even collect the entry fee. We know that at least 100 men showed up at the house of Ogedai to challenge Kutiyun to a match, because she collected a fleet of over 10,000 horses. It's safe to assume that many of these men who came to win the match were probably feeling overly confident before they arrived. They probably thought that defeating a princess would be a piece of cake, but they left feeling totally humiliated. It probably took a few matches before word spread that this was no ordinary princess and that men would need to train before they could even think about challenging her. These wrestling matches were talked about throughout Mongolia, and many people like Marco Polo traveled to see the fights. Kutiyun would show up wearing a garment called Kendal. This was usually worn by men when they practiced the martial arts, but she would show up wearing a version that was made with expensive fabrics. Her suitors usually showed up wearing a similar style. Even though they were fighting, they still showed up looking their best to the crowd. In the year 1280, when Kutiyun was 20 years old, the son of King Palmer arrived to try his luck in winning a match against the princess. The prince offered to wager a thousand horses instead of the typical 100. Marco Polo described him as being young and incredibly good looking, and he was surrounded by an entourage of servants. When he showed up in the town and announced that he wanted to battle Kutiyun for her hand in marriage, men, women, and children all showed up to witness this wrestling match, and it drew the biggest crowd by far. Her parents were very impressed. They thought that he was a perfect match for her and encouraged Kutiyun to lose on purpose so she could marry him. She replied that she would never lose on purpose for any amount of money. The man who was truly worthy of her hand in marriage would win without her throwing the match. To his credit, this prince lasted the longest out of any other wrestler to ever lock arms with the princess. After she slammed the prince onto the palace floor, the cheering stopped and the room went silent. 
For the first time ever, the audience was actually disappointed that she had won. Since he lasted the longest in the wrestling match of any other man, maybe Kuta Yoon was truly considering if she should throw the match. However, this man was exactly the sort of husband her father would have arranged for her. If you think about it, that does kind of defeat the purpose of her being able to choose her husband in the first place. After years of kicking ass and taking names, people began to wonder why Koo Yoon wanted to be a single virgin for the rest of her life. Rumors began to spread about her. In modern times, one might assume that she was a lesbian, was asexual, or perhaps even transgender. Despite Mongolia being one of the most progressive countries in the world at that time, they were still not accepting of homosexuality. So it's very possible that Koo Yoon had a strong sense of self, and she wasn't going to allow her father to force her into a marriage that would make her miserable. At the time, the idea of being a lesbian wasn't even an option in the minds of the public. Rumors spread that Kaidu may have even had an incestuous relationship with his daughter. However, this is probably unlikely. Unfortunately, it's a rumor that was said of a lot of women back then. It was just so out of the ordinary that a daughter was held in such high regard by her father and that he allowed her to remain unmarried. The situation was so odd, people simply didn't know what to make of it. According to a Persian statesman named Rashid al-Din, Kuti Yun was fighting so hard for freedom because she was in love with a man named Ghazan. He was the Mongolian leader of the Persian territories and a direct descendant of Genghis Khan as well. That meant that they would have been cousins and maybe their union would have been forbidden because they were too closely related. Whether the theory is true or not, Kutiyun never did marry Ghazan. He is remembered for converting to Islam and setting the new precedent for future rulers in modern-day Iran. He married another princess named Kokochin, who was nicknamed the Blue Princess and remembered for her stunning beauty. Marco Polo helped escort her across the desert to meet her new husband. Kuti Yun would have been the polar opposite of this dainty, frail princess. It's possible that her heart belonged to a man that she simply couldn't have. We never do learn if Kuti Yun got married, if she remains unmarried having affairs with men, or if she was secretly enjoying a harem of her own. Most historians believe that she was single for the rest of her life because a raw wedding surely would have been on the record somewhere. What we do know, though, is that if she got married, she would have never been allowed to live out her one true passion in life, which was to be a warrior, and she continued to do just that. Like the male Mongolian warriors of her day, Kuti Yun participated in many battles alongside her father and his army. Since she was lighter than a male rider, she was able to gallop in on her horse at faster speeds than her male counterparts, and she was just as strong. Marco Polo describes her technique of galloping up to an enemy soldier on the opposite side of the battlefield, picking him up with just one hand, and lifting his body off the ground while on horseback, and delivering the enemy back to her side of the battle. She was like a hawk flying in on its prey, and the enemy was understandably terrified of her. Kaidu Khan felt that Kuti Yun was the best warrior in his army, and she would have been a very capable leader. She was even given a silver medallion called Gurji to wear around her neck. This is like the modern-day equivalent of becoming a decorated general. She is the only Mongolian woman to ever hold that honor. And let's just appreciate that statement for a moment. For Kaidu to say that his daughter was the strongest warrior in his entire army is a big deal. Even in modern times, it would be almost unheard of to say that a woman is stronger than an entire army full of men, and the Mongolians, they were born and bred. To be war machines. Even though Kaidu Khan wanted to appoint Kuti Yun as his successor, putting a woman in charge was against the rules. This was fine with Kuti Yun, though, because she was much more at home on the battlefield than in a diplomatic position. Despite her hesitation to take over the throne as a young woman, she still attended her father's court and was present for all of their important meetings, so she was well aware of the local politics. The matter was dropped, and all of her brothers expected that one of them would be declared the next Khan whenever their father passed away. In the year 1301, King Kaidu was dying, and his dying wish was for Kuti Yun to take over as Khan. Even though he had 14 sons, none of them could possibly have been as good of a military leader and a political leader as his daughter. He attempted to break all Mongolian traditions and appoint Kuti Yun as his true heir. At this point, Kuti Yun was 41 years old. She had years of experience behind her, and she was respected and feared amongst the army. She was also old enough now to feel that she was ready to take on the role of leader. However, her brothers, they weren't having it. A man named Duo was given the position as the new Khan of their territory. 
In 1306, Kutiyun was killed, and there is no record as to exactly how she died. Considering that she had a following of soldiers who respected her, it's possible that there was a power struggle and that she was killed. Most of you may have never heard of Kutiyun until now, and that's probably because there is very little information from people who actually knew her. Marco Polo and Rashid al-Din are the only two historians who were around in the 1200s to write down the details of her life, and each of them only devoted maybe one or two pages of their books to her story. Despite the fact that she was barely mentioned in these texts of the Mongolian Empire, the story of her strength was so fascinating it was still passed along by both Mongolian and Chinese people by simple word of mouth. Just like a childhood game of telephone, her story was convoluted over the years. In the 1700s, a French writer named Francois Petit de la Croix wrote stories from Asia for a Western audience, and he included a version of Coutillon's story. Only in his telling, she was a Chinese princess named Turando who refuses to marry a man unless he could solve three riddles. If they fail, they die. This story was eventually made into an Italian opera. Cutie Yoon also briefly appeared in the Netflix series Marco Polo, but it barely scraped the surface of how truly awesome she actually was. And we hope in some way that with this video, we've helped the true story of Cutie Yoon, the warrior princess, live on. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below. And don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos three times a week. So hit that subscribe button and that notification bell if you actually want to get notified about these videos. And as always, I'll see you next time.